and get started. Beth, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Lisa. Am I unmuted? Yes. Okay, thank you. Welcome everybody. Thank you for being here today. It's, it's great to see a, a really good crowd from around the country and uh, here for a, a really good part one uh, of our uh, symposium on building and remodeling archives. Uh, we've built extra time into this because there's a lot to talk about and probably a lot of questions to come. Um, so we're gonna get started in just a moment. Uh, before we do, I would like to introduce our executive director, Joy Banks, for a few uh, remarks. Thanks, Beth, and thank you to everybody who is here joining us today. When we started talking about educational sessions this year and our committee was thinking about different topics and building archives came up, we did not expect such a positive and overwhelming response to this topic. So we went from an hour long typical webinar that we would usually host into a two part symposium and then further extended that to make those sessions longer just because of where our community is right now in this conversation. Um, it seems to me as though there's a really healthy number of state and territorial archives talking about this, which is going to allow us to share all all types of suggestions and tips and make connections with each other. We're also very glad that we could welcome Chris Wood to join us as a keynote presentation. It's a special edition for us to have somebody in the architectural field uh, join this conversation and share his knowledge with us. So we're really hopeful that you benefit from this conversation today. Uh, we'll have a nice, healthy time for question and answers at the end. And we also hope that you plan on joining us for a part two when that comes up in June. So back to you, Beth. Thank you, Joy. So uh, we have a lot to get to today. Um, we've got six presentations to get to. Um, and we'll be starting with the keynote by Chris Wood. Uh, looking forward to that. Um, and then we will have five uh, state territorial archives um, representatives um, talking about their projects and their plans. Um, we've got some questions that have already come in that uh, we will ask of the panelists after the presentations um, and certainly be opening it up to um, any questions you might have as well. Um, so uh, I'm gonna get started by introducing all of the speakers now so that I don't have to interrupt the flow um, once we get into the presentations. Um, so this is gonna take a couple of minutes because there's a lot of speakers and they have um, very impressive um, uh, experience. Uh, so I'm gonna start with our keynote speaker, uh, Chris Wood. And again, bear with me as I get through all the speakers. Um, Chris Wood is an architect and vice president with the Smith Group in Washington, D.C., where he directs the firm's cultural studio of architects and engineers focusing on museums, interpretive centers, archives, performing arts centers, and historic sites. In his 24 years with Smith Group, Chris had, has led projects for the Smithsonian Institution, the National Archives, National Park Service, U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum, and other state and private museums and archives across the country. He's a member of the Society of, Society of American Archivists, the American Institute for Conservation, and the Land Economics Society. He's currently leading projects for the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts, the Wisconsin Historical Society, and the Oregon Historical Society, Marblehead Archives, and the National Museum of African American History and Culture. So we'll look forward to um, Chris's keynote speech in just a few moments. Um, our scheduled speakers from archives today are um, Lopez Matthews from the District of Columbia. Um, he is the State Archivist and Public Records Administrator for the District of Columbia, and in this capacity, he serves as histori historian of the District of Columbia, as chair of the D.C. Historical Records Advisory Board, and director of the D.C. Office of Public Records and Archives. 
a native of Baltimore, Maryland. He earned a bachelor's in history from Coppin State University in 2004, then earned a master's in public history and archival administration from Howard University in 2006, and a PhD in US history from Howard University in 2009. He's a member of the Council of State Archivists and an executive council member of the Association for the Study of African American Life and History, and he hosts In Retrospect and Prospect for ASALH TV, where he interviews practitioners about African American history projects. He's published several articles and is the author of Howard University in the World Wars, Men and Women Serving the Nation. In 2020, he became a senior advisor to the US Truth, Healing and Transformation Leadership Group. And in 2023, he was appointed by the Secretary of the Interior to the Mary McLeod Bethune Council House National Historic Site Advisory Commission. Uh, our next speaker from Iowa will be Anthony John, the State Archivist of Iowa and the Historical Library and Archives Bureau Chief for the State Historical Society of Iowa. Prior to joining the state of Iowa in 2014, Anthony worked for Target Corporation for 23 years, including as the senior corporate archivist, historian, and records manager, records manager, records manager for over a decade. And from Rhode Island, our next speaker is Ashley Salima, who serves as state archivist and public records administrator for Rhode Island. Ashley holds a master's degree in library and information science and a master's degree in public administration. As a native Rhode Islander, Ashley is passionate about three things in particular. One is connecting Rhode Islanders to their local history. Another is cooking and another is her chickens. Um, and I'm just hoping the cooking and the chickens are not too closely related. Um, our next speaker will be Michael Como from Massachusetts. Michael is the executive director of the Massachusetts Archives and Commonwealth Museum, both divisions of the Office of Secretary of the Commonwealth. Michael joined the staff there at, at the newly constructed facility on Columbia Point in Boston in 1987. And he's held a number of different positions there, including head of reference services and deputy state archivist before he became executive director in 2011. He also serves as a chair of the board of directors for the Northeast Document Conservation Center. At the, excuse me, at the archives, Michael supervised the recreation of the Commonwealth's State Museum, helped reinstitute the State Historical Records Advisory Board, oversaw the creation and implementation of the archives' first comprehensive electronic records program, drafted and promoted legislative action to advance records preservation and access on both the state and local levels, and worked to establish relationships with external partners to provide for the digitization of the archives collections. Michael has dedicated himself and the resources of the Massachusetts archives to emergency preparedness for the cultural community. He served as founding member and co-chair of COSTEP MA, the coordinated statewide emergency preparedness, and was a local re representative for the COSA sponsored IPER initiative that some of you may remember the Intergovernmental Preparedness for Essential Records training program. Through these channels, Michael has worked to fully integrate the Massachusetts archives and other cultural institutions into local, state, and federal emergency management. And he's also spearheaded over $15 million in capital improvements to the archives facility most recently in the construction of an $8 million expansion of a new environmentally controlled vault storage for the archives. And our final speaker from Indiana is Chandler Lighty. Um, Governor Holcomb appointed Chandler Lighty as executive director of the Indiana Archives and Records Administration in August, 2018. Prior to that, he led the Indiana Historical Bureau, where he expanded the number of state historical markers installed annually, initiated an oral history of the Indiana General Assembly, and oversaw creation of an award-winning podcast, Talking Who's Your History. Um, Chandler has served in various public history jobs since 1997, including museums, archives, document editing, and digital humanities. He earned an MA in history from Miami University and graduated from the History Leadership Institute sponsored by the American Association for State and Local History. His other professional service roles include the boards of the Indiana Historic Preservation Review Board 
the Indiana Association of Historians, the Indiana Magazine of History, and the General Lou Wallace Study and Museum. Uh, so thank you for listening to all that. Um, and I think we're through listening to me speak. And at this point, I would like to introduce our keynote speaker, Chris Wood. Right, I'm gonna share my screen here. Um, first of all, thank you for the invitation. Um, I'm really humbled to be in such company after those introductions. Um, I'll, I'll start with a, with a quick additional introduction. I know that everyone on this call probably has a story of when the collections bug got them, uh, given your professions. But as an architect, uh, for me, very early in my career, um, I had the great opportunity of doing the programming for the National Archives uh, National Personnel uh, Records Center in St. Louis. Um, uh, many of you probably know that um, the Personnel Records Center suffered a catastrophic fire in 1973. Um, they have an entire conservation lab dedicated to the burn files from that and reconstructing them. And it was just one of those classic Indiana Jones um, experiences of, of wandering those aisles um, and, and seeing just the quantity, uh, uh, but also the specialness in the VIP room with the, with the presidents and, and dignitaries that are, that are preserved there and all the personnel rec records basically since the Spanish-American War. It was a really formative experience. Um, I was lucky to be part of a firm uh, that had a long history in working in collections care. Um, we, as a, as a firm, have, have spent probably 40 some years working on, on archives and, and museum collections facilities of all types and all different kinds of, of media uh, as the oldest AE firm in, in the US. Um, and so, in the course of that history, you know, lucky to work on the, the Library of Congress um, National Audiovisual Conservation Center in Culpeper, Virginia, which is, you know, like the Library of Congress in DC, as many of you know, everything that is on film or tape or audio recording, including wax cylinders for medicine, um, resides there. Uh, and it's known also for its um, nitrate vaults uh, for all the explosive um, uh, combustible film that is there. Um, uh, I, I was lucky enough to lead the, um, the project for the National Holocaust, um, uh, US Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, DC, their collections facility in, in Bowie, Maryland, um, and uh, worked on the National, uh, or the Wisconsin Joint Preservation Facility, which is a, is a, a multi-tenant facility for the state of Wisconsin um, that houses uh, the Veterans Affairs as well as the Historical Society. Um, uh, but, you know, also the Wiener Mobile. Um, before we get started, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about what you do before you start. And I, I think it's, it's kind of a classic story that I've encountered that um, archives, when it comes to funding, uh, tend to be stuck at the kids table. Um, and you guys spend so much of your, your careers, if you need to build, um, asking for money and attention, and it's and it's unfortunate. And so, sometimes as we start talking about this process of design and building, maybe it also helps to just acknowledge that um, sometimes you have to define the need first, and sometimes you have to do that in in you know dramatic ways. Uh, you know, if if you need a third party assessment um, uh, to to hire, you know, someone like Michelle Pacifico or others, you know, that can come in and serve as that neutral party to say, hey, there is there is a need here. We are beyond capacity. We're in a facility that can no longer maintain environments. We have leak issues, whatever it might be. Um, don't be shy about that. Um, I, I know you guys all talk amongst each other. Everybody has their their horror stories of, of, of storage that may not be um, as we would all want them to be, but sometimes those can be your best asset when it comes to developing a need case um, uh, for your facility. So when we talk about getting started um, at the beginning of a, of a planning process, um, there's some really key questions that I think asking yourself 
uh, will prepare you for a design team. So before you call an architect. Um, so who are the tenants? Um, if you're a state facility or a private facility, um, is there a single user? Are there multiple agencies that are going to be using the facility? Is the funding stream, you know, coming from multiple entities? Uh, uh, but also, you know, you can imagine how that has implications on access and planning. Um, who are you serving? Uh, are you serving the community in some way? Are you serving researchers? Um, uh, what is the public facing component, uh, if any, of this facility that you might be planning? Uh, and what are you storing? I mean, that's the obvious question, of course, but um, media makes, um, uh, uh, has a big, big impact on planning. Uh, there, are, there are state archives um, and that, that house media that may be incredibly sensitive, you know, as the example with the nitrate films in uh, Culpeper might be. Uh, volume is incredibly important to understand. Um, what are your compartmentalization requirements going to be and, and security considerations? As we get into planning drivers, um, Existing conditions are obviously important to understand. They will serve as the baseline for um, the work that you do. As is often the case, if you're building, it's because you're out of space. It's because it's already too bad. Um, uh, it's because you're already, you already are experiencing problems. So um, the first thing to do is understand how well you know your own collection. And, and sometimes it, it, you might need help um, from an outside consultant of some kind to help you do a collections assessment from a volumetric perspective. And you know, unfortunately, sometimes that means going shelf by shelf. Um, uh, there, are, there are ways to do it efficiently um, and make sure that you're starting with an accurate accounting of, of what you have. So, we tend to put that into a boring spreadsheet. Um, it's just the best way to get things organized. You may already have tracking mechanisms um, uh, with your institution. Uh, this is sometimes combined with a physical validation, an in-person validation going shelf by shelf to understand things like decompression, you know, how much, how densely is your collection stored? And do you need to factor in things like that? So we'll take that existing collection. You don't need to read this. This is just an example of a matrix that we may put together, we'll take the existing collection, we'll neutralize it, so to speak, so to speak into volume. Um, if it's a library collection, we might do it in linear feet. Um, volume tends to work well um, if, uh, for, for other types of three-dimensional collections, cubic foot boxes, things like that. We'll apply decompression and we'll rely on you um, to help us understand growth. Growth sometimes requires a crystal ball, Sometimes it can be based on trends. Sometimes it's predictable. Rarely it's predictable. But you know, we worked for the the state of Arizona, and in you know, in the law, anything that comes out of the ground, if you're a utility company and you encounter uh, an artifact of some kind, it automatically goes to the Arizona State Museum into their collections, and they have consistently a hundred cubic foot boxes a year that come into their collection. So for that component of their collection, they have predictable growth. Um, other, other areas we might just have to guess. We'll typically use a 25 year outlook just as a rule of thumb as a minimum for, for growth planning because as we all know, we don't want to plan, build, design and construct a facility and then outgrow it on day two. Um, we then for each of those categories of, of collection will apply an environment. Um, sometimes the environment is consistent across your entire collection. Sometimes it's not. Sometimes cool and cold come into play. Sometimes different humidity requirements come into play. Um, and it's helpful to make sure that that tracks along with the subcategories of collection that we are um, um, analyzing for volume. So what we'll do then to get out of the boring spreadsheets uh, is we'll draw that three-dimensionally. It just helps intuitively to understand your collection probably taken out of the context of its current state, maybe just on a blank white canvas to understand each of those different subcategories of collection. Um, how, you know, how do they uh, compare uh, volumetrically? So we'll, we'll color code them by environment so that we can keep track of those things. We'll use your nomenclature for collections categories so that we're all talking the same language when we're referring to things. Uh, and then we'll apply decompression to it. Um, if, 
Uh, like I said, if you're building, you probably need to store things less densely because you've had to make do for several years and pack things more closely than you would want to. So all of a sudden, your day one ideal collection storage is larger than your current collections facility before we've even applied growth. But then we apply growth. <laughs> and, and sometimes growth can have um, uh, really substantial effects. But it's not consistent. We never like to apply growth across your entire collection unless it's an incredibly consistent collection. We want to make sure that we compartmentalize your collection um, by its different types, understanding provenance, understanding other you know, storage requirements so that growth is applied um, in a way that is tailored to the subcategories of collection to get to a total volume. Collections facilities obviously um, uh, rely heavily on storage furniture. Uh, so we've got all of our volumetric data. Um, the next step is to translate that volumetric data into area, because as architects, we need to understand how much space is this going to take up. Uh, and you know that is done three-dimensionally, but when we're talking about real estate, if you have um, a space that exists, we, we need to understand the footprint of that. We'll typically start with a, a really sort of benign vanilla layout. So, you know, maybe it's eight foot fixed shelving um, just to set a baseline. That allows us to then test some scenarios. If we went, for example, to eight foot compact, you know, what are the savings there in, in, in real estate? If we went to 12 foot compact, um, if we went to a mezzanine, a shelf supported mezzanine, mezzanine system, what would the savings be relative to that, that benchmark? Um, we do this not because we're going to put everything into the same format, but because we know that we're going to land in some sort of a mixed hybrid between those, um, it then allows us to um, assign those to different subcomponents of the collection based on ergonomics, access, access frequency, um, or just your site. If you're in an urban site or if you're in an existing building where your real estate is fixed, we, efficiency is going to be the goal. Um, we've recently started to use um, higher tech tools, um, parametric design that allows us to plug that collections data into um, software. And based on questions from you, we can adjust things like aisle width, shelving height, um, uh, shelving format, and immediately be able to, to push out metrics on how efficiently we're taking care of your collection. Uh, in a project we were working on here with the Franklin Institute in Philadelphia, which is not an archive, but they have a massive um, uh, collection. Uh, this was a, a project where they wanted to explore open collections. So being able to plug in some variables, you know, what are their aisle heights for different or aisle widths for certain types of collection? How much of the collection do they want to be visible? Um, what could go into compact and what couldn't? And just by answering those questions um, immediately generate some test fits. Um, just based on these parametric three-dimensional tools and see the impact of those. So testing multiple, multiple scenarios to arrive at something that is um, satisfying as many of their needs as possible um, because efficiency isn't always the goal. There are always competing factors for how you might lay out your collection. Um, then there are the people spaces. So you know your, your largest component of a collections facility is probably your collection storage, but um, most facilities also have other program um, that is vital. If it's a museum, sometimes we'll see design and production shops um, or other things that don't wanna have direct proximity to collections, but may still be part of the facility. There will be administrative offices. There might be a conservation lab of some kind. Um, there might be an archeology span component depending on the type of, of collections facility. So we'll, we'll do the same thing that we did for collections and, and just visualize the program for all of the spaces um, to understand um, the relative puzzle piece sizes and then work on things like adjacencies with you um, since your work is so process driven. We like to compartmentalize um, or categorize those spaces um, by type. And it's usually driven by whether the space is collections containing or non-collections containing, and whether or not there, there are humans who will be spending most of their days in any of those spaces. Um, we do this because as we then go through our planning exercises with you, um, it allows us to overlay environmental conditions. So zoning um, mechanical systems such that we aren't being wasteful um, and can uh, 
you know, uh, consolidate collections containing spaces that are going to have the tighter temperature and humidity requirements um, in a portion of the building uh, that, that allows the systems to be tailored to it. Um, recognizing that collections facilities are highly process driven, um, the first thing that we'll do is try to understand your process. That was um, hundreds of diagrams that I worked through with the National Archives, understanding everything from the loading dock through collections and conservations and back out again. Everything from the request, in that case, for an archive being pulled through collections and back out. If there was an art, if there was a researcher that came to visit, what is the workflow of, 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 of pulling something, getting it to a reading room, staff assistance, asset control, and back into collections? So we'll map that out diagrammatically with you because every, every collections facility is different. One thing that I would say here is that this is a great example of where um, planning actually impacts your operational dollars over the long term. Um, for example, you know your arc, your standard archival air bulk collection storage um, should have within it if you have cool and cold collections, cold and with or cool storage, and then nested within cool storage would be cold storage, so that each of those, as you know, can then acclimate and come, uh, you know, come from cold into cool and cool into regular archive without facing condensation issues from the temperature shock between the two. But you can also imagine what that does from a systems and an envelope perspective um, to make sure that those uh, uh, aren't fighting one another uh, by sitting out on their own. So a little bit about systems and environment, um, because I think the, the elephant in the room with with a lot of collections facilities is, is sustainability and energy usage. Um, most facilities are 365, 24 seven um, uh, set points. Uh, but when we think of that in the context of energy usage and carbon emissions in the environment, I think we need to acknowledge that buildings um, represent about just buildings in general represent about 70% of, of electric consumption um, in, in the world. In archives specifically, uh, that electric usage is comprised of about 70% or more just in space heating and cooling because of those consistent um, um, set points. About 10% on lighting, which has improved quite a bit with the advent of, of LED lighting in most facilities. But there's some questions that you need to ask yourselves here too. So, Understanding that operating costs will exceed, will exceed your construction costs over time. Um, you as stewards of your state budgets um, need to consider, of course, that uh, the first cost of a particular air handler unit um, is not the only factor. That paying more for a custom air handler in some cases because of the efficiency over time, um, that payback period, if it's within the lifespan of the equipment, is worth considering. But you have to ask the questions of your design team to know and, and undertake that life cycle analysis to make sure that you aren't throwing um, good money after bad uh, with um, excess operating costs. Um, consider the payback period of your systems uh, and envelope upgrades. So uh, the most sustainable thing you can do um, is not putting photovoltaics on your roof. It is making sure that you have the right amount of insulation on your building and insulation and vapor barriers on buildings um, and new construction when possible um, pay back every single day. Um, but they also pay back in the sizing of your day one systems. You can imagine if your envelope is like a Yeti cooler, um, you need a much smaller um, HVAC system to keep that at um, temperature and RH. Uh, leaky buildings um, are, are just bleeding money every day. Um, but there is a there is a threshold, right? So understanding through that that cyclical life cycle analysis with your um, mechanical um, designer and your architect, the threshold between um, enough insulation and too much insulation uh, uh, for first cost is important to understand. Um, seasonal off offset is a real thing. It should be considered on every facility. Um, we know that industry trends and um, Image Permanence Institute and, and all of the industry data point to the fact that um, collections can withstand gradual, um, reasonable seasonal fluctuations if those are properly controlled. The plus side of that, of course, is 
of uh, potentially massive energy savings where you aren't asking your systems to unnecessarily fight ambient conditions outside more than they need to um, on a seasonal basis, obviously ruling out any um, short-term spikes. Space planning, as I mentioned before, will impact HVAC efficiency and zoning. So um, having your engineers at the table at the same time as you have your architects at the table is really important. Um, those two things, your engineers can't follow your architects and make it work. That, that's not a, a good integrated process. Everyone should be at the table from the beginning along with you. Um, redundancy and emergency backup is something to consider on ev every facility. Um, it is a sometimes a personal institutional choice. Sometimes it is driven by state requirements. There are best practices out there, but um, in my experience, it is always an institution by institution decision. And sometimes the people who reside at those institutions, in, in this case, maybe you are making these decisions. So um, consider and educate yourself on, on the reliability of the utility network in your area. Understand how often outages happen, of what types of outages, if we're talking about natural gas or if we're talking about um, uh, uh, the electric grid. Consider, rather than holistic equipment redundancy, which is where you have a duplicate air handler um, uh, for every air handler you, you need, that you could look at component-based redundancy. So instead of a single fan driving your air handler, they now make fan arrays. So every air handler has a grid of 20 fans that are driving the air. And if you get a motor failure in one, you're still at 90% capacity. Um, and that can be repaired um, without taking the entire um, system offline, uh, consideration of some downtime. Same thing with cooling towers. Uh, mobile backup for chilled water or things like that, if there are particular types of first cost that the project just can't bear, could you put in the infrastructure to allow for a per portable generator, portable um, uh, chiller to come in those rare instances where you might have an outage? So uh, one quick detour that I think is worth mentioning, especially in this company, we, we've all visited facilities that we admire. Make sure that when you work with a designer that you, you save some time to do some benchmarking. If, if you're lucky enough to um, be able to vet and hire a designer that has done work like this before and they have a wealth of experience and some benchmarking of their own that they can bring to bear, that's fantastic. In many cases, because of state procurement requirements, you may end up with a design team that may not have done a lot of archives before. Um, it's good to build in time to visit the facilities that you admire so that your designers and you can hear from the people who work in those facilities and what drives them crazy every day, what works really well, what they would never do again. Um, those are the kind of things that are going to save you from paying down the road in your design process. Um, so I would highly encourage that. There's so much to talk about when it comes to um, design. And, you know, with, with the capital A architecture, I know that um, as I kick this whole thing off by talking about how often um, folks in our, your field um, end up begging for, you know, rounding errors in the budget uh, to keep their facilities going or to build new, um, quality of design is sometimes the, the first thing to go. Um, we have a motto uh, when we start these projects, and it is don't call it a warehouse. Um, uh, having, having a facility that um, is something that you can be proud of, that you can raise money for because donors may actually get excited about it um, and could be an asset to the community is not unachievable. Um, the facility we did for the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum uh, was done on, the, on an incredibly strict budget, but you wouldn't know it by looking at it. It was relentlessly planned for efficiency in all ways. It was a box that was, was shaped only to shed water and provide a little bit of interest. Um, structural savings were embedded by introducing an expansion joint so that we only upgraded um, seismic and, and um, blast protection for the collections areas, but the production shop and the staff offices didn't have that. Um, 
uh, looking at really um, cost effective rain screen solutions that would allow the building to be buttoned up and waterproofed and insulated. And while the contractor was finishing the exterior, they could already start flushing out the interior to save time on construction. There are strategies that can that can afford um, uh, design beyond a warehouse for collections facilities. And so uh, there will always be those that start um, your design process thinking of it in that way. And we would just en encourage you to open your minds and think of the think of the potential while while being responsible stewards of your budget. Um, so I, I'm just scrolling through some some pretty pictures of, of reading rooms and libraries and archives and things that we've worked on um, in, in the past, um, because at the end of the day, it's great if we can all be proud of these facilities, um, because people work in them too. Um, and that's the other thing that we that we make sure that we reinforce along the way is that as much as these are facilities that are centered on the collection, um, they have to be pleasant places for staff to work. Um, and that doesn't mean that they need to be caves. Um, there's great north facing light to be had um, for, for collection spaces and labs um, if, if well planned. Um, and we would encourage you to hold your designers and those who hold the purse strings accountable to make sure that uh, uh, you're, you have a seat at the table and you can be a part of that design process. Um, and with that, I think I will wrap up and hopefully I stayed reasonably on time and we can have some discussion and questions. Chris, thank you so much for that. I think um, I think we're gonna hold the questions till the end. Uh, if I'm remembering that correctly. Is that right, Lisa? And um, yes, we can do that. Okay. All right. But we're, we're, we've already got a couple of questions coming in. Thank you folks for uh, typing those into chat. Um, and we will uh, keep track of those as well as some other questions uh, that we already had. Um, and thank you so much, Chris. So many good things to think about, um, planning steps and considerations. And, and we all know not to call it a warehouse now um, if, we, if we had been doing that. So thank you. Um, I'm sure there'll be some some questions for you later on. Um, and at this point, I would like to introduce our first uh, State Archives presenter, uh, and that is Dr. Lopez Matthews from DC. All right. Well, uh, thank you, Beth, for the introduction. And that was uh, very interesting, Chris. Uh, you mentioned don't call it a warehouse. That's something that we have been uh, trying not to do in the District of Columbia, trying to get people to understand that it's not a warehouse, it's an archive and a state-of-the-art archive. And so before I start with uh, my slides, I normally have six minutes, so I will try to be good and stay within my six minutes. I'm going to keep my eye on the clock. Um, our work in D.C. to create a new state archives has been uh, long overdue. We started in 1986, so we are fairly new in terms of state archives. We moved into our current facility in 1992. It was a retrofitted uh, horse stable, and we've been in that location for 30 years. And it was at capacity two years after the archives moved into that facility. So they've been in need of a new facility for Washington, D.C. for a long time. The idea of building a new archive first developed about 20 years ago. But this current iteration of building a new D.C. state archives, and we say state archives because we are preparing for D.C. statehood, so that is why my title is State Archives. So this current iteration of the project predates me, and it started about eight years ago with public forums, and studies, and what do we really need to create a truly state-of-the-art archive? in Washington, D.C. And over the eight years, slow progress, slow moving. It really ramped up last year. I, of course, started last year as well. I've been in my position for a year and one month. So I have been uh, kind of catching up very quickly. We are working with a great team of architects who have been with the project 
I believe, for that entire eight years. And so they've been very helpful with kind of helping us understand what we need using their experience with previous archives because they built previous archives. I think Chris mentioned Michelle Pacifico. Michelle Pacifico is working with us on our project. And um, so we're very fortunate to have her there to kind of give advice, and really support ideas that we have. I've been able to meet with her and speak with her and kind of share thoughts that I have and bounce ideas off of her. And that's been very helpful in terms of developing our position in terms of what the facility will look like we, it is a facility for the Office of Public Records, but we do provide space for archival collections held by the University of the District of Columbia. Uh, about five years ago, they decided that the archives facility should be located on the campus of the University of the District of Columbia to kind of support the educational aspect of the archives and allow the University of the District of Columbia to also participate in supporting archival projects at the archives and then us also support possibly developing archival training programs at the University of the District of Columbia. So if we move to the next slide, because I know I have two minutes left, I'm going to show you what we have developed as a concept for the new District of Columbia archives. And so next slide, please. So this is what the campus looks like now. You see that tall building towards the left of your screen. That is the current building that stands where the new archival facility will be. Uh, next slide. That is the concept of what the new facility will be. It will be a combination of archives and records center. And so that's why the building is so large. And that's why there, is, there are spaces with no windows because it's going to combine a record center and an archival facility. So next slide. That's just another view of the current building that stands where the facility will be located. So next slide, please. That is a back view of the concept of the new facility. So next slide, please. That is, this is a concept of what the landscape will look like. And if you look at the building, the lighter orange areas are lobby, lobby exhibit areas. The darker areas are public spaces. The one at the bottom is a multi-purpose space for lectures and classrooms. The one in the center is an exhibit space for an exhibit and the space at the top is the research room. And so you see part of our plan is to include lots of green space back into the campus. Next slide, please. So just another view of the archives and you can move to the next slide. I'm moving. <laughs> These are just some other views, proposed views of the facility from the campus. Denar Plaza is the, uh, kind of quad area of the campus. And so you see that at the bottom right of how it would look as you walk across there. It is metro accessible, bus accessible, and there is a parking garage underneath for public visitors. And then there'll be a space for our employees to use. So I believe next slide, that is our last slide. So I have stayed within my six minutes there. And so that is what we're doing in the District of Columbia. Thank you. Thank you, Lopez. This is uh, my name is Tony Jane. I work for State Historical Society of Iowa. I'm just going to jump in. Um, the uh, just if you go to the next slide, um, just bringing everybody up to date. We um, we we are currently in the State Historical Building, which is uh, literally just to the west of the Iowa State, the beautiful Iowa State Capitol. Um, and when they built our building in 1988, there were uh, large problems from the moment we opened it with water, with environment, uh, all kinds of challenges. Um, no vapor barrier, um, like a granite that was falling off the walls. Um, lots of renovation needed to happen, and that began a multi-decade 
discussion that began to take place within the Iowa State government of trying to fix the building, um, which culminated after uh, in 2013 with receiving an appropriation to have an outside third party consultant come in and to do a building and collections assessment, which took place. That work was done in 2015. And then in 2016, they came out with a $69 million plan to renovate the building and update it, which soundly was either reacted un uncaringly by legislators uh, they didn't want to fund it uh, to a number of people in the community who were very upset um, for a variety of reasons that we'll get into on this webinar. Um, and so we took a step back and we took a look at what what really needed to happen. Uh, and the biggest priorities we began to identify within the building were the fact that we had uh, water drainage pipes that would just suddenly burst because they were flawed uh, with uh, micro fractures. And uh, we need to get those replaced as soon as possible uh, because they had been bursting for years, bringing staff in at two and three in the morning to clean up little waterfalls within the building. And so we were able to get a $6.6 .6 million appropriation to begin to address that. That, fix our water pipes and fix our skylights. And as part of that, we uh, we identified there were water pipes within our uh, his Iowa Historical Research Center library. This is where the public comes in and accesses the materials from the state archives as well as from other materials. And so uh, we had enough time uh, back in 2017 before construction would start in 2019 to take a really methodical approach on addressing that and uh, coming up with solutions. And so just some things that we did is we created a, to create a clear plan. We basically reached out to the public. We conducted surveys, focus groups, really asking people what did they want? What do they want in that space? How do they want to access Iowa history? How do they want to interact with the collections? Uh, received wonderful feedback, wonderful information from the public. We use that to basically build the, the basis of design for the space. We also use it to have the conversations with our architectural firm that was uh, that has been with us for the whole life of this project for nearly 10 years now. And uh, in working with them and our uh, business, our, um, our essentially property owner, which is a uh, part of state government, the Iowa Department of Administrative Services, we came up with infrastructure plans to add more electrical, more internet, uh, bring in more equipment to, to uh, reconfigure the space so it's, so it's adaptable and very usable for the public so they could easily get at things and, and be able to use our collections, make it a comfortable place for staff to experience, remove certain walls within the space to open it up Bring more, uh, bring more views of the collection within the, that space, as well as uh, create a vista to that people can look out to the state capitol. Um, really transforming it into a completely different experience, and you'll have to attend the, the, uh, the, <laughs> the webinar in another month to see all the wonderful things we did as part of that. But also, what we learned as part of this is it gave us great knowledge to even a bigger project that um, that we started to identify back in 2017 that we needed to do. If you advance in the next slide, please. Um, uh, when we first put our high density compact shelving in for the state archives, um, it was not even intended to go into the space that was put into, um, it was just given to us. Um, and unfortunately from the moment we put the high density compact shelving in for state archives, which encompasses about 41,000 cubic feet or linear feet, um, we had problems with it. It wasn't working properly. It wasn't performing properly. They never leveled the floor. They didn't wire it correctly for electricity. Uh, and I think the basis of the design uh, was uh, it was not properly vetted. So as a result, uh, the, the, the shelving from the very beginning wasn't working properly. And by the time I became state archivist in 2014, we were beginning to having failing shelving. And then by 2017, the shelving was basically not opening properly to the point to we're using emergency power to move the uh, power to assist shelving. And then the mechanical assist shelving, it just will not rotate. As you can see from the image right here, we have a staff person in the row that's about 21 inches wide, which is uh, very difficult for us to get into uh, and very difficult to access the collections. And so uh, with this particular project, we decided to take a really kind of a professional approach on it and really think about in terms of what do we need need? What do we need the space to look like? What do we need the design to look like? And so we took the, use that to basically inform what our plan would be. 
we didn't have the funding to create this plan. Uh, we needed fifty thousand dollars to create it. The state legislature was not going to approve it, pro appropriate it, and the agency did not have the money. So we worked with the National Endowment of Humanities and created a planning grant application, which we submitted in twenty twenty one. That was fa that failed. That did not succeed. We went back to them in twenty twenty two with that same application. We took their feedback, we made those adjustments, and we were able to successfully get that grant. And this past fall, we actually began work on developing the plan for what the um, what that space would be, which is illustrated in the uh, the right image. Basically, uh, to, the, to reorganize the space, to eliminate powered assist shelving, go to mechanical assist shelving, so the shelving will really will be able to last with minimal uh, renovations and improvements over the next 30 to 50 years, as well as to rethink the space altogether and how we're collecting, how we're managing, uh, adding space for growth. We calculated that into it. So we came up with the metrics to be able to figure that out. And ultimately, um, when we eventually get this project funded, which is we're in the process of working on that right now, hopefully within the next couple of years, we'll be able to completely transform the space into a to basically an access point that is more than just a uh, basically more than just a capital project, more than just a warehouse, as we, many of the presenters have already talked about. It's so we'll basically have a space that will allow the public to get access to collections instead of which right now can take hours, if not days, turns it into minutes and then allow us as a staff to be able to better manage our collections and be stewards of our collections and ultimately be able to advance the interests of Iowa history into the future. Um, and that's all I had to share for the moment. Um, we'll go ahead and pass this off to Ashley Selma with uh, Rhode Island. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you for uh, letting me be a part of this conversation and just kind of join in and share about the efforts in Rhode Island. If you can just put up my title slide here. So I did do a full length uh, slide deck here, but I did want to share this image. Um, so this is actually an article from 1924 um, talking about the importance of urging more safeguards um, for the state's archives. So I am kind of here today, not necessarily as a successful yet project, but mostly to share about the fact that these things happen over usually long streams of time. And if there are a lot of false starts or you got like do a little bit and then it starts the cycle all over again, it's still worth engaging in. And I encourage anybody who's looking at potentially being put into the, the prospect of a new facility to just kind of hunker down and keep with it um, because it does take time. Uh, so like many states, you know, in Rhode Island, our path hasn't been linear. Right now, um, we are not yet in a permanent facility. We are again in a planning phase and really working towards a permanent purpose-built space for the state's archives. It's been uh, championed several times and it's one of those pieces of conversation that as the state that is one of the original 13 colonies, we have records going back to 1638, including original copies of the Declaration of Independence and the Bill of Rights and other really prominent and just fantastic documents that have significance to Rhode Islanders, but also, you know, Americans in general. Um, it's really remarkable that we haven't yet gotten this effort done, so we continue to push for it. Um, so again, I'm just here to encourage everyone to keep trying. <laughs> um, so just a little bit of background for what our efforts have been. Um, Rhode Island State Archives is the only state, as far as we know, at last survey, um, that our primary and only archive facility is in commercially leased office space. Um, so we've been in the commercial lease space. <laughs> Thank you, Joy. I agree. Um, so since 1989. So the preservation of the state archives and the documents that we maintain has been under these uh, guise of the Secretary of State since the days of the general recorder going back to 1647, but the state archives as the entity we know it today under the Secretary of State's office was only established in 1989 in public law. So in, the, in 1989 is kind of when a lot of the things that were kept in the basement of the state house and in other disparate locations throughout the state being safeguarded, but not all together in one location, were brought together under the umbrella of the archives in one space, and that was leased office space. And we stayed in that same location for just shy of 30 years. Um, it means that without the purpose-built facility, we are in a situation where we have multiple media stored together. Um, we have different formats and we are able to do our best, um, but not the best practice that we would like to do. 
Currently, our lease space also means that we have the limitation of not all of our records are able to be on site with us, which fortunately is not a huge impact on our researchers because we are able to communicate effectively on that front. But we obviously, as I'm sure all of you guess, want to bring all our records together under one roof in a project like this is the way to do that. Um, I will say in the middle of the pandemic, Rhode Island did get an excellent chance at a dry run uh, of a relocation when we actually had to move from one lease space to another one. Um, it gave me the opportunity to do the research that earlier Chris was speaking about, about the needs for a vault um, and really digging into those NFPA and NARA standards, which actually the NARA standards we received from Michelle Pacifico. So we have also worked with her in the past. Um, she's She's been a really great to work with. And um, during that move, setting what those standards are. So we moved from one office space to another, but we were able to actually work to have in our IRP to build out a more proper actual vault here. So we've moved into a place that is climate and humidity controlled, but it's not our ultimate home just yet. Um, but we did do something that I think is key uh, for any kind of large relocation project, and that is the entire collection at the box level is entirely barcoded so that everything can be safely moved and we have that intellectual control over everything and it's integrated into our catalog. So that is also something that I literally cannot emphasize enough when it comes to ensuring that nothing is lost or misplaced is as you're going through these processes, documentation, unsurprisingly, as archivists, is our best friend. Um, so we have the opportunity to build a permanent facility now that we've had our uh, incidental dry run uh, to move the collection. And we've been really doing a lot of communication over the past several years about the importance. And one of the biggest challenges here in Rhode Island has been the lack of knowledge about the state archives. For such a small state, we have 39 municipalities, and there are distinct and dynamic and wonderful organizations throughout the state, all dedicated to history at the local level. And we have two very large historical societies as well. So with all of that history spread throughout the state, the state archives as an entity, other than for, for lawyers and genealogists, we weren't as widely known. So one of the first things that we started to do was really work on for lack of a better term, an awareness campaign. It's very difficult to win over our constituency that we need a purpose-built facility on state property and do those things that required lots of funding um, if they don't know who we are and what we do and that these records benefit them. So that kind of public advocacy is a really important beginning element in the planning phase. Aside from that, in Rhode Island, we have done a couple of different studies, which Chris also mentioned early on, um, so we have actually been doing various studies since about 2002. So when I started my six minutes, I think I had about a minute left, um, and I said that these things take time, we've had multiple prominent studies throughout that period that in some ways they say the same thing, but each one has taught us something new along the way. So I'm going to really quickly kind of run through that. Um, one is they, they studied what is known as the Cranston Street Armory here, which is a beautiful old building. But they studied that back in 2002, and even at that point, they found even though the building is historic and of public interest, the build-out would be cost prohibitive for the Rhode Island public um, to really foot the bill for. Then in 2016, there was a needs assessment um, that was done to really overview the entire collection and see what the collection needed for now and with at least 10 years worth of growth and to estimate what the collection would be and how each individual would need to access it, whether that be physically for research or for exhibition space, which is something we currently lack. Um, we then went forward and did a site selection study in 2018 to try and find the best place in Providence, um, which is our capital city, that we could put the archives. Because right now we are like down the hill and a ways away um, from Smith Hill, which is you know our, our capital of the state house is. And we're trying to identify a location that would bring us closest to that piece of tourism to help increase it for those state house tours and student visits. And then lastly, we did a feasibility study for another historic building in 2020 to see if there was a potential for reuse, which again, gave us a much more recent example to share with the General Assembly and other interested parties and stakeholders that while these buildings are beautiful, it's actually more cost effective and it has a lot more longevity to move forward to that long, long-term purpose-built facility for an archive because of the special needs of it. And by having that communication tool, it's been a lot more effective this time around. Uh, we've been very fortunate that we are with a new administration right now. We have a new Secretary of State um, who is very engaged and very excited and, and really believes in the importance of preservation of history. And he's been doing a tremendous job sharing this message again and really breathing new life into it. So 
I get to have the opportunity of looking forward to see where we go from here after having had these conversations a couple of times over. Um, so before I pass it on, the last little piece of advice I would have if you're entering into planning is be ready to answer the same questions again and again and again, <laughs> no matter what the stakeholder group is. Um, and the top three I would say are, why not digitize it all? Why can't an old building hold records that are old? And three, how do historical collections increase tourism? You're gonna hear those again and again. And I recommend you kind of come up with your own list of those hit questions that will help you along the way. Um, so thank you. I, I hope I didn't speak too quickly and I'm gonna pass it over so you can hear about the experience in Massachusetts. Thanks, Ashley. Um, the Massachusetts Archives Building, uh, where we uh, reside now, was uh, originally opened in 1986. We had a bulk capacity of about 30,000 cubic feet and about 19,000 square feet. The central core of the building, uh, which is in the, if you look at this this uh, this image here, it's in the top right corner. That was the, the original vault core. So everything was sort of built out around that to sort of functionally... Um, you know, accommodate the uh, the transfer, the ingest, the management, and the preservation of records long term. Uh, the original design by uh, the architectural firm that was involved with the facility projected a period of about 25 years before they envisioned that vault expansion might be necessary. There were various administrative decisions uh, made over the years that really sort of accelerated that need. Um, you know, things like, as an example, with institutional case file records, whether it was mental health, retardation, public health, public welfare, correctional institutions, uh, taking those in in total as opposed to sampling, uh, and various other uh, decisions that just really escalated our need for additional space. By the um, early 2010s, we started to hit a, uh, a moment of crisis. Uh, and by necessity, then, we started to overcrowd our existing vault space to the extent, really, that we started to create some occupational hazards, things like, you know, boat shelving from excessive weight and sufficient spacing between shelving aisles um, and, and areas, inadequate lighting, and, and potentially even in some areas, uh, you know, fire code violations. So this lack of capacity forced us to put many agencies ready for transfer on hold, which basically then forced them to absorb the costs of, of holding their permanent records until resolution of our space issue. Um, so uh, change the slide, please. Uh, so planning for our expansion really began, um, in, uh, 2015, uh, with, um, a facility sort of, uh, an engineering report. Now I'm going to stress two things that, that were really impactful for us and important, and that's, um, relationship building and opportunity. We were at the time in 2014, we were replacing the HVAC systems in our existing vault core. Um, and at the time, the project engineer who had worked with us in the past and was very interested in our mission, which was good to have, he was from the Department of Capital Asset Management and Maintenance. Uh, that's the um, the agency in Massachusetts that oversees all public facilities and, and their maintenance and, and, and sustainability. Um, I started talking with him about the need for uh, additional space as we move forward. And he, again, took great interest in our plight and promised to bring it to his superiors in DCAM. Uh, and he suggested an engineering study to be conducted. And that was where we began the, uh, the ball rolling. For funding, uh, we actually looked to a DCAM bond uh, bill. Uh, it was, uh, we were just a, a, a pot really of a larger bond built for capital facilities, repairs and improvements around the Commonwealth. Um, so we, we sort of got stuck in there. Our initial sort of projections were somewhat faulty. We, we did them quickly. Uh, we projected out what we thought we could do. And unfortunately, we, we came in a little light with the initial sort of uh, ideas of what we're going to need. But we, we got lucky along the way through relationships, which I'll explain in a minute. Um, so again, the planning begins in um, 2014, uh, 2015, rather. Um, and by doing this uh, formal repair of the HVAC systems uh, in our existing vault core, um, when that work was completed, DCAM, the agency, was looking for uh, clients they had uh, performed work for in, in, in recent years and were looking for endorsements so they could continue to get their funding that they needed. And they looked to us to support, uh, because they thought we were an interesting sort of case study, to support uh, their good work, which we were more than happy to do. And we became very friendly uh, with the commissioner of DCAM at the time uh, by endorsing um, you know, their particular work. And I'll explain how that sort of pays off benefits uh, in the future. Um, also, as this is happening now, these reports are being made. Uh, next slide, please. Things are being itemized out. We're pricing, uh, you, know, you know, the various uh, contingencies we have to look at. We also had to uh, do a fair amount of convincing and lobbying within the administrative offices of the Secretary of the Commonwealth as well, because we had to convince them 
uh, in addition to the agency that was going to help us perform this, uh, that within our own operation, how necessary this was and how the cost benefit would, uh, you know, for, for the future would really be beneficial for the secretary's office. So there was sort of a concurrent effort in lobbying there. Um, next slide, please. The necessary expansion uh, required uh, dissembling of existing uh, storage area for something called the State Record Center. Again, kind of like a warehouse. I know we don't like that term, but it was kind of like a warehouse. Um, and to do that, uh, we took sort of a portion. That was a, an area that had a, roughly about 200,000 cubic feet of storage capacity. And we took roughly a, about a third of that to have the first phase of what we considered the archival sort of environmental controlled storage area. Um, in doing that, I sort of mined the experience of other COSA colleagues who we were very fortunate at the time. Uh, I, I sort of connected with uh, my colleague, Matt Beach, the former state archivist of Kansas. And Kansas had recently engaged in a very similar circumstance where they, they repurposed their existing space in the state record center, sort of farmed off that capacity to commercial vendors, and then again, repurposed it for controlled uh, space for archival collections. We followed that example very closely, and they were sort of our coal mine canary. They were just, you know, literally just before we had, we had finished. So, um, but before we had started, rather. So we, we got a chance to look at their experience. Um, again, the forward thinking of the original architect was good. They had included design elements within the structure that, that saved us uh, a lot of money because they had envisioned the need for eventual expansion. So they had basically, you know, uh, poured in pile caps and things like that. We could we could send the the, um, the columns and support columns that you see in the picture here. Uh, so that that saved us a great deal. Um, DCAM had us draft a statement of need next. Um, and uh, again, as I said, the funding was secured through a bond bill. Uh, next slide, please. With that, our initial, as I said, our initial cost projections were light, um, but because we had this good relationship with uh, the commissioner of DCAM, when it came time to add on costs uh, and, and f find additional funding, she literally lobbied for us in addition to the secretary of the Commonwealth. That was a very powerful ally to have. So again, I can't stress enough the, um, the benefit of, of solid relationships. Um, with that, we began sort of weekly planning, uh, DCAM and the engineers involved. We had the design firm, we had the general contractor, we had all the various sub uh, subcontractors involved. So we had weekly meetings, you know, basic punch list things that you've probably all seen in the past, but going through this in a very detailed way. Next slide, please. And then they, they always kept like sort of a two week look ahead period. So we'd make sure that we were on, you know, on target for different things. And if we had cost overruns and so on and so forth. Um, the basic components, of our uh, our project included a feasibility study. They thought that would take about three to four months, and again, they were relatively on target. There was some there was some sort of stretching out of the schedule. Um, then there was the design through the building services that we had hard construction costs, which included um, overhead and profit. Uh, there was a fifteen percent contingency. Uh, included for construct, uh, construction design, professional consultant services for construction were included as well. And then a standard sort of uh, format and equation that DCAM used, we had escalation to midpoint of about 5%. So our all in costs were just under $10 million with everything. Um, the, uh, you know, the, the need for um, examining what you need, as, as Chris was talking about, being aware of benchmarks and whatnot, we had actually used as a, as a sort of a, in addition to speaking with Kansas, we had used a repository that Harvard has in, in the middle part of the state, a large offsite repository that they gave us a really good sort of example to follow. Um, our design is scalable. So again, this is the first section of that, but it can be built at a reduced cost. Now as we move it out into the other area of the record center as we repurpose that long-term. So uh, that's just a couple of the highlights. And with that, I am going to um, pass it on to uh, Chandler Lighty from Indiana. Uh, thanks, uh, Becky, next slide. Um, so we heard from Ashley and I guess if there's uh, any hope for Ashley is um, <laughs> maybe it's the example of Indiana here. Um, uh, what I'm gonna cover is essentially 40 years of history of trying to get um, the Indiana State Archives um, built. Um, next slide, Becky. Um, so uh, in 1985, um, on the left, you'll see a photograph that ran in the Indianapolis Star. Um, in the photograph is uh, Bob Boots, who I know Josh is on from Illinois. Bob still works in in archives and records. He's, uh, he's the records manager at Illinois. Um, but 40 years ago, he was a young man working for the Indiana State Archives. And um, he was he was proclaimed as a whistleblower here in the Indianapolis Star about the state of uh, Indiana's records and archives. Um, at that point, 
the uh, archives uh, was in the state library in the basement underneath drain pipes, um, which um, 10 years later, nine years later, uh, presented quite a bit of problem where a heavy rain um, caused the drain pipes in the basement to overflow and flood and um, prompted the Indianapolis Star to give us another um, headline in the newspaper. Uh, next slide. Um, so the, uh, did we skip one? Um, no, I guess we, okay, never mind, Becky, sorry. Um, so they, uh, this prompted a lot of creative thinking on how to solve this issue. Um, I should say before I go on that the Indiana, we're under the executive branch, um, so we don't answer to SOS like many of you do. Um, and so, you know, when we have a problem, we're asking the governor's office. Um, and so in 1997, um, Jerry Hanfield, who was state archivist at the time, Jerry's still around, he retired from Washington and what state of Washington um, in 2012. Um, Jerry was the first one to try to really advocate for this. Um, as as executive director of the agency. But this uh, letter here, which you probably can't read, but uh, the final few paragraphs are kind of amusing. Uh, one is the governor's office is proposing moving the state archives to the re recently vacated space at Camp Atterbury or vacant buildings recently identified at Jefferson Proving Grounds. So essentially move the buildings to military bases that weren't designed as archives. Um, and then the kicker is the, the bright idea in the final paragraph that um, the governor's office wanted to sell uh, Pepsi Cola and aiming, aiming rights to the state archives <laughs> as a way to fund it. Um, unfortunately, I don't have the second page of this letter. I would have loved to have known who wrote it, but um, um, I have not located that yet. But um, that was just kind of the kind of the sense about you know how how do we, how do you deal with this problem? Um, okay, next slide, Becky. Um, so in 2000, uh, Jerry, who's shown there teetering on some shelves, trying to reach some boxes in, in the state library uh, archive space, um, he decided to pull everything out of the state archives, uh, out of the state library, and move to a facility on the east side of Indianapolis in a warehouse district. The building, um, this building was built in the 50s or 60s. Um, it was designed not as an archive, but as a as an RCA record pressing plant. Um, so retrofitted for an archive space, um, but over the past 23 years, a lot of problems. Um, one thing, um, roofs with, with hole penetrations are not ideal for archives because they leak. And also you don't store, you don't position your HVAC system above an archive uh, collection. Um, but uh, over the course of 20, 20 23 years, um, you know, first Jerry, and then followed by his predecessor, um, Jim Corden, um, who I replaced um, in 2018, um, led to some strong advocacy for for improvements to this facility. And often that that had a lot to do with, um, you know, building friendships and relationships, particularly members of the General Assembly, um, in particular, because I know this will be public, I'll shout out former Senator Jim Merritt, uh, former Representative Tom Saunders, Representative Matt Lehman and Matt Pierce, and former Representative Tim Brown. Um, they kind of like the history cohort of the General Assembly that, um, you know, they, they kind of pressured, pressed, pushed on this uh, idea for 20 years or more to, to get it done. Um, next slide. Um, but in 2016 uh, was Indiana's bicentennial, right? Bicentennial is a great time to build an archive. Right. Um, and Jim Corden, who was, again, my predecessor, he really pushed on the idea then, um, got some plans developed. And this this uh, post uh, building was to go on the campus uh, of Indiana University, Indianapolis, here in downtown Indianapolis. Um, had had a lot of public space, a lot of space for classrooms for for Indiana University to use it in addition to the archive space. Um, the plan for funding this was contingent on leasing cell phone towers. Um, that method of funding did not come through. And so the, uh, the plans stalled. Um, next slide. Um, so um, I came on in 2018. Um, I kind of quietly, I'm much different than Jim. If, if any of you know Jim, 
<laughs> I approach things much differently, but, um, you know, I just, in my quiet way, tried to, you know, push on this issue, but realistically, I was like, nothing's going to happen. You know, a few fortuitous things that happened. I'm just kind of in the right place, right time. Um, the influx of COVID money has really affected the state forecasts. And so um, in the 2021 uh, budget cycle, the Indiana General Assembly appropriated $40 million for us to plan this budget. Um, what they didn't count on is the cost of inflation. So <laughs> what we're waiting on any day now is for the General Assembly to appropriate $97 million, which will allow us to break ground here in, um, in the summer. Um, so a lot of perseverance, um, a lot of things um, keeping at it, um, but we're, we're finally here and we're, we're about ready to break ground. I think I'm at time, so I will kick it back to Becky, thanks. I think I'll I'll take it here. Thank you, um, Chandler and Michael and Ashley and Tony and, and Lopez um, following up on, on Chris's keynote with some um, some really interesting and insightful um, and encouraging uh, remarks. Um, it's, it's it's certainly good for all of us to remember that this isn't something that happens in a year or two, and we might be looking at decades, but um, persistence eventually does pay off. So um, good words from all of you. Uh, we do have some questions that we'd like to get you uh, get to, um, questions that we had going into this and, and additional questions that have come in um, during the presentations. Um, so uh, for anyone uh, of the state archivists who would like to answer this, um, there's a question about what recommendations you have in communicating with designers and architects and builders. Sometimes we speak different languages. So how do you uh, come to an understanding of of definition of terms and and uh, and what your needs are. How do you how do you communicate with that way? Anyone, if you want to take that on, I'll just I'll yeah, sort of kick it off. That that is an issue. Yeah, I mean, if you know, we're dealing from our perspective. You're meeting with designers, with an engineers, and, and general contractors and whatnot. They have their own. As you said, parlance for everything. I think the critical point is right at the right at the outset, and this has been echoed by everybody that's spoken today, um, that you have to be very clear in your needs and uh, the, spe the specifications of what you know you require in the final sort of the final product. They are as ignorant of what we need as we are of their general professions as a rule. So, um, you know, we would have to make a very coaching case. And again, we were very lucky in our experience in the planning phase because we had these weekly meetings. We'd sit down with everybody and we'd literally go through piece by piece. Okay, this is what we need. This is why we need it. Th these are the standards that we're basing upon. These are the sort of the best practices uh, that we th that, that are essential. Here's the degree of acceptability of any variance from that, uh, that standard. I mean, there are certain ab absolutes, of course, and that just this was a necessity. Everything at least it was our experience, anything can be done if you have enough money to pay for it. And that's when it became sort of, you know, uh, an interesting discussion, because how do you then get the, the absolutes that you need at a price you can afford? Uh, and so those are some of the more interesting engagements we had with the various vendors that we interacted with. Um, I, I'll just add, in our, in our case, our, our design firm ratio, um, they were involved in the 2016 project. So they'd kind of, they'd essentially been living in the what the, what an archives needs for many years um and they were also just like very receptive to um you know other things that were happening in the field um i i wanted to give a shout out to david carmichael because david at pennsylvania has been was very helpful to us and i think in many ways um they uh they looked at what our the ratio looked at what pennsylvania was doing and and, and tried to imitate so I think uh, same thing in D.C. in that our firm, Hart McCox, has been with us for eight years. So they had a pretty good idea of what the Office of Public Records needed. And so we meet fairly regularly. And so, you know, you can massage that into the way we actually operate day to day. And then, you know, you say, oh, you know, I have this idea, you know, how does this fit in? So I think time with the project is probably the biggest factor in understanding what your actual needs are. 
you know, just one additional thing. I think when it comes to these projects, it's you cannot understate the role the the, the project manager, the construction project manager. Um, sometimes we don't have that luxury of picking them. That's usually picked for us by our state enterprises. Um, so it's good to know who they are, and then you can figure out where their knowledge gaps are and try to. And usually they're pretty good. They they want to they want to succeed. Their contracts depend on that. So, how do you can you get time with them and and help them bring them along, bring them up to speed? Our architectural firms have been with us this Newman Munson for over ten years, so they they already had it all figured out and understood. So whether it's your project manager, your owner's representative with the state, uh, as well as we've had a couple new ones through the lives of our projects to make sure that they understand and spend time with them and really kind of coach them and bring them along. And then you get the meeting of the minds on the, the language and the communication. Everybody knows who everybody else's interests lie, and then you can have a more successful project. I don't want to tarry the, the commentary. The only thing I would say is um, understanding that you have to take time to answer the question, which sounds really obvious, but there are things from an archival perspective that are very standard to us because they're industry standard or they just make sense. But just saying, no, it can't be in a basement because that's bad, like is not enough context for someone to really work with. And the more information you come forward with and share the logic of it, not just that, well, we can't. It does a lot of relationship building, but then it also kind of cuts down on the amount of times you have to communicate the same facts over and over again with new audiences, because you're bringing people that have begun to understand already that can help you, so. Thank you. Thank you for answering that question. Good, good points there. Um, Chris, there were uh, some questions that came in during your keynote. Um, and a, a couple of them were, were kind of related to each other from a couple of different people um, that relate to calculating growth um, and question as to how do you do that? How do you calculate growth in collections um, and what metrics do you use for that and um, how those metrics might change from metrics you might've used in the past um, so that you know, we, we calculate growth and then we run out of space in two years. How do we avoid that? Um, how do we how do we go about that? And, and what metrics do we use? That's that's a really great and difficult question. So um, the first thing that's absolutely critical that I think I may have mentioned is making sure that you don't think of growth uh, monolithically, that you're compartmentalizing your collection into its subcategories, whatever they may be for your particular institution. Uh, and you uh, bring around the table the stakeholders that deal with those collections um, and, and have a session to talk about them individually. Sometimes with um, collections facilities, uh, grow, it's less growth as capacity to allow acquisitions. So you may have had to turn things away as, as an archive because um, you didn't have space for them in a particular category. Sometimes that type of buffer growth is something that needs to be thought of. Institutional archives, for example, um, may, may be the kind of thing where you have trend data, where you are receiving them at a reasonably regular pace over the, over the course of time, and you can apply that to that particular category. And then there will just be those that you have to guess. Um, but by compartmentalizing it and not applying growth figures um, monolithically, you aren't either hopefully over or under providing on, on, on growth, and it's at least as, a, as informed as it could be. But it's always the most challenging conversation to have because it feels very risky for any individual to be the one who says, I'm the one who's going to say this is going to grow 20% over the next 25 years when I'm guessing just as much as the next person. Um, but uh, the even a well-informed guess is better than not planning for something at all. And you may find yourself in a situation where the powers that be push back on some of that and it gets compressed. So it doesn't hurt to be a little bit conservative on the front end because uh, you may get some pushback. Glass is half full point. You don't have to buy that storage furniture day one. Your architect can make sure that you have the physical space for it, but maybe as a first cost, you're not procuring those ranges of compact shelving for growth, and you use that as swing space. So it can still be useful space to you, even if you're not populating it with empty shelving on day one. 
Thank you, Chris. We're running up against time here. Uh, I think we have time for one or two more questions. Uh, I'll try to get them in quickly. Um, and, and this one's for, for anyone who wants to um, provide some insight. Um, how does the understanding of archival workflows and processes affect the design of your project? Um, looking at, at the importance of functionality and, and space efficiency um, versus making a visual statement um, with the, the structure. Um, how do you um, how do you work through those those understandings? I'd be really curious to hear for some others, but I will just say as an architect, if there is a building type that has to be planned from the inside out and by understanding workflows first, it is it is an archive. Um, uh, you know, everything, all, all roads lead to the loading dock um, and through processing um, and isolation and pest management. And, um, you know, they, the end result may be a spot on a shelf, but it's all of the processing spaces and loading and unloading that really drive and will, um, will be the bane of your existence if they're improperly planned forever, if they aren't done right the first time. So um, there are plenty of ways to rigorously plan and be efficiently oriented and still think about architecture, the best buildings, um, the, the design expresses the functionality. And so um, I, I know that there were some examples shared here where, where I know, you know, I have a ton of respect for the work department Cox. I'm sure that's the way they worked with you, um, Lopez. And, and so I would just uh, encourage your architects to understand your process first. Yeah, functionality for us in our experience was really critical because we had had sort of the the down experience of of overstuffing our existing vaults. So it was difficult for staff to to access records and to manage a daily workflow. So when it came to the point of actually having this new space and talking with the architects and the designers and and, and eventually the uh, the uh, general contractor, yeah, I mean that was almost first and foremost in our in our mind. Our building had been originally constructed to accommodate the flow of records, and again, you know, necessity dictated that we sort of disrupted that flow within the the existing um, vault areas. So yeah, I would just say that it was it was a priority in our experience. And I was actually going to say that Chris, we we work toward compartmentalizing the functions of the building to make sure that everything was accessible. For what we needed on the archival side and then the public side as well kind of compartmentalizing that for ease of access to the public since that is something that is very important to our advocacy groups and the council and those who are funding the project you know how can the public access this facility since it is a problem that we have now you know our building is really not accessible by the public and so that's one of the desires of this new facility. So you already said it, Chris. All right. You know, Beth, I just have a quick question of all of our panelists here, because this was something that we experienced as well. And in, in planning phase, they experienced the same thing. We had a fair degree of investment in ADA compliance upgrades that were triggered by um, the, um, you know, the, the proposal to expand our space. Chris, can you maybe give us some insight on that as, a, as an element to consider? Um, well, it's the law. So um, I think the most challenging um, types of projects when it comes to collections are adaptive reuse um, or continuity of operations within existing facilities where you need to make upgrades, um, protect the collection, accommodate the public, do the dirty construction work uh, and bring everything up to code all at the same time. Um, so I, 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 would, I would say that in terms of triggers, it's it's less about whether you have to or not. Um, I think as a best practice, you should be doing it anyway if you're undertaking any kind of project. Um, but you, you bring up a point of existing facilities that we haven't necessarily touched on today, which could be its own webinar. Um, you know, it's, not everyone has the luxury of building a brand new facility. And so if you, if you have been handed the card of an existing facility that was never intended to house collections, and you need to adapt it for the use of collections, there, there's a myriad of concerns, um, one of which would be ADA upgrades, but envelope insulation systems, um, load bearing capacity, all of these things that come with adaptive reuse, 
um, that I'll stop there because it really does deserve its own webinar. <laughs> Um, I, I'll just add that I, I thought a lot about it as we're, you know, talking about furniture solutions and whatnot, you know, adjustable tables in a reading room, or um, just recently we were going back and forth with our techs regarding the door to the archives facility. They wanted a solid door, and I said, what if somebody with wheelchair comes up? Because they wanted to take away the self-assist. And so we shift shifted that solid door to a glass, a partial glass door, so if somebody needs assistance to it. Um, we even had discussions about, um, Tani Nelb was our archive, archives consultant for Ratio, and um, Tani really pushed for us to consider changing adult changing stations in the bathrooms, which, I mean, you think about, um, I mean, that's a that's a very cogent thing for, you know, our, our audience. Um, it, it ultimately ended up on the cutting room floor, but I think, you know, um, stuff like that, uh, thinking about our audience, um, and we we have we have a lot of volunteers who are in their 80s, and um, you know that was a, that was a consideration too. You know, um, you know how 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 can our space continue to be welcoming for them? That's a good point. Good point. Um, thank you all. We're uh, we could easily go on for another hour or two, um, and and we're we're a bit over right now. Um, so I want to thank uh, all of our speakers. Um, it, it feels like with all the information and insight you've presented, we've just scratched the surface. Um, so we can do a little more scratching um, in the next webinar, part two of this, which I'm really looking forward to. Um, thank you all. Thanks to everybody who attended. And I think I'll turn this over to Lisa to wrap up. Thank you, Beth. Thank you, presenters. What great information you've presented and what extra questions you've now tossed out to the rest of us that we had not even considered before. But as we go forward, if you enjoyed today's webinar or got something useful out of it, I hope you'll continue looking for our member webinars. Uh, next month, we have a Cosenar webinar on Replevin. And then in June on June 23rd will be the second part of this where we'll actually talk about construction and lessons learned. So we do hope that you'll join us for that. Next slide. Of course, we wanna make sure that you also look for our SERI electronic records programs and they have an unconference coming up on May 18th. So I hope you'll check that out, register and attend that. Next slide. Always, it's easy to contact us with COSA. Reach out any number of ways. We look forward to hearing from you. And last slide. Uh, we want to thank our sponsors who, without their support, we would not be able to do many of the things that we do here at COSA. And finally, um, if we didn't get your questions today, you know, let us know. We will uh, try and maybe include them in the next one. And next slide. Thank you all for joining us today. We There should be an evaluation when you close. We hope you'll take a moment to answer it. Uh, it really does help us as we plan future programs, and we appreciate your input and insight. Thank you all for joining us. Presenters, thank you today. Beth, thank you for moderating, and we'll see you at the next COSA member webinar. Have a great day.